bluer skies of Western Europe against the German Air Force. This is the P-47, the Thunderbolt, a fast, tough, high-altitude fighter with a dive like its name and an eight-gun blast in its wings. Here is the Lightning, the P-38, master of the air in many theaters of war. The long range and concentrated firepower of this great fighter counted in Western Europe, too. The Mustang, the P-51, longest range fighter in the world. Speed, fast climb, quick dive, tight turn. A fighter pilot's dream. Into these three great fighters, America poured its genius. It's millions of man hours of labor, it's faith in victory against the Luftwaffe. And in their single cockpits, it placed its carefully chosen sons, trained to a fighting edge, trained as never before. Here is their report, catch as catch could, by their own gun cameras in the instant of action, and delivered in return for your toil and your treasure and your high hopes. and others, to attack them whenever, wherever, and in whatever strength they appeared, our direct challenge for control of the air. Trucks bring the pilots from the field to the squadron dispersal hut for intelligence interrogation after the mission. Coffee and sandwiches if they want it. Little action today, just a routine escort. You saw four 190s on the field. That's right. Harry saw him, too. I think it was this field, Jack, further west. We made the 180 here and flew about two minutes on 340. Well, that's about 15 miles south of Hanover. We thought that field was knocked out. They seem like ordinary American boys, but look a little closer. Now they pile in a Jeep and ride to Charm. They have Jeeps enough, but they like it this way. They kid a lot, high-spirited. And later they relax and enjoy the not-too-frequent sunlight. Unless some joker is present, and he usually is. They keep pretty fit, ready to stand anything up to seven hours in a single seater in substratosphere, alert every second. And they keep their eye in. This fellow has 22 destroyed. Well, he may have if he keeps at it. And they won't be clay pigeons. The old swim at hole is the same in England as at home. They had a beautiful summer in England that day. A little aquatic practice won't hurt either. They may have to make a high dive with chute and become a channel swimmer almost any time. Of course, it gives their airborne pals a fine chance to practice low flying a bit. The swimmers take no chances on this buzz job. Maybe they're learning not to get behind the eight ball here. Put the six in the corner. Getting in shape for Wimbledon in a small way. Good shot. Keep your eye on the little white ball, Eddie. Keeping up with their crooning, naturally. May need that in the good old by and by. Everybody's favorite newspaper in this town. What goes on in New Guinea, China, and Luzon? What's happening at home? Best of all is their comradeship. Fellows who are trusting one another with their lives in this teamwork war learn to be friends. Somewhere else in England, and another day, from deep sweeps into enemy territory, a weather reconnaissance plane flies in. Its reports are cross-checked with many others. 
writing the destiny of today or tomorrow in atmospheric pressure lines. Fear in this theater means not impossible, and weather is almost enemy number one. At 8th Air Force, General Doolittle discusses fighter protection. The 8th Fighter Command will give fighter cover to targets and back from the targets. Desirable that we peel off as many fighters as possible to come down east of the Ruhr and straight ground targets. How many do you want to peel off? Well, General, we're spreading over a pretty wide area there. Uh, I'd recommend very seriously that we hold that. I'll straight into a minimum. We call it right Go ahead and send that over to the 8th Fighter Command. Yes, sir. The bomber plan, timing, altitudes, forces, course, and targets have reached the combat operations room at headquarters 8th Fighter Command. Major General Kepner commanding. Now the General and his Chief of Staff, Brigadier General Griswold, come in to inspect and discuss the plan of escort. Colonel Burns' operations determines what group shall fly. Colonel James decides their disposition. Colonel Callahan, intelligence, estimates where and when the enemy will intercept. It's an intricate scientific plan, based upon information from many sources and upon the route and location of the target. Then a field order goes out to the fighter wings and through them to the fighter groups and squadrons which they control. This command supports 1st and 2nd bomber forces. 62nd Group P-47s will escort heavy bombers over enemy coast through target to limit of endurance. All observations will be reported over RT. The field order is received at the fighter base by the duty officer in group operations. He checks the field order for the group rendezvous time with the bombers. He calls maintenance, armament, and others. And in the still dark hours of the morning, a squadron intelligence officer shakes the pilots out of their deep sleep. Briefing at 6.30. Oh, um, why can't they fight the war at a reasonable hour? Wake up over there if you want any breakfast. There's a show on. Crews, meantime, are warming and priming the aircraft. The crews are a vital part of this show. Tune their kites to fighting pitch. Going places, as always, long-range wing tanks are fitted. Now briefing and everybody present. The colonel comes in. These fellows are veterans of many missions. So he gives them the essentials without ceremony. Okay, we're on the table ready. Let's go to the table. Box of bombers, 36 ships to each wing. We're on the front end, the first task force. Picking up the Manhattan area, around the target, about 20 miles east of Manhattan. At which time, we will proceed up to the very rooms north of Frankfurt, where we will stray. Now today, I want to use the same system we used the other day. That is, dividing the field up into sections, the one squadron only on the field at one time. When the ammunition is expanded from that squadron, you move up and let the other top of the squadron come down and straight.
ceaseless training plus battle experience has taught them to recognize the enemy almost by instinct. Where they are, how they act. First hostile aircraft is spotted. Blue leader here. Watch it, fellows. 109 to 10 o'clock. The enemy fighters are massing for an attack on the bombers while our pilots watch every move of their very tactics. You don't let it move flight. Looks like they're trying to lead us away from the bombers. Green leader here. You're right. Here comes another. 9 o'clock. Blue leader here. Blue flight got tanks. Yellow and green flight stay up for cover. The Mustangs drop wing tanks and plunge into the fight. The head-on dive through the fortress's formation is a favorite. So fast sometimes and so many, our fighters cannot head all of them off. The Huns make a sneak attack at our bombers from behind. Some of them get in close as this captured enemy gun camera film shows and hammer our bombers with their 20 millimeters. It's punishing, but they shall pay. The Mustangs are in the thick of it, and the battle ranges all over the sky as other formations join in. The Jerry's attack in waves and sometimes inflict great damage before they're driven off. catches fire and goes down in flames. The German pilots are determined. So are ours. To the death. another, but they cannot stop us. Our fighters, often heavily outnumbered, engage the enemy all over the sky. And this battle is only one of many. Day after day, month after month, Mustang, Thunderbolt, Lightning, against the ME-109s and the FW-190s. Our fighters are tanked, attacked, attacked. Two into ten, six into fifty. They broke up the enemy's mass assaults. Then his shattered flights were pounced upon and destroyed individually. Our victory column soared at the rate of four to one. Great and gallant days they were. Many new aces, many empty places. Victory, victory, death, victory, victory.
ever-increasing fleets of fortresses and liberators pressed relentlessly onto their targets. Whenever attacked, they defended themselves with legendary gallantry and effectiveness. If a missed rendezvous or other misadventure due usually to blinding weather prevented fighter protection somewhere, they suffered heavy losses. But no American fighter ever failed them because of enemy odds, however great. Never was a mission turned back by enemy action. Our bomber and fighter losses, though strikingly less than the enemy's, were heavy. But the home front sent us more bombers and fighters, and more well-trained pilots, and our fleets grew mightier by the month. But the enemy first-line operational strength was maintained also. The great air battle of Europe was still undecided. In February 1944, there was a sudden change. Our fighters were ordered to range wider, even at some risk, to the bombers to seek the enemy instead of waiting for him, and above all, to follow him to his destruction. A gigantic fighter battle raged across the European skies with victories by our fighters alone of 60, 85, over 100 destroyed each day. The fight came down from almost invisible heights to the final decision, perhaps only a few feet above the ground. Enemy warplanes of every kind and in fantastic numbers were splashed all over the landscape of northwestern Germany and occupied Holland, Belgium, France.
the steady, relentless bombing of Germany went on without ceasing. Against the enemy's occasional desperate efforts to intercept, we maintained fighter escort every step of the way. But the sky was ours, and another great opportunity was ours, his teeming widespread intricate transportation system, feeding and supplying the great armies which he counted upon to throw our invasion forces back into the sea. Then something happened. roads and railroads were struck with a mighty force of air power. They were tense days, crucial days, and both sides knew it. Our fighters, freed by their bitterly won victory in the air, became a dominant factor on the ground. These thunderbolts are dive bombing. They strike home. But by far the greatest, the almost paralyzing destruction they inflicted was by the burning, hard-hitting fire of their 50 caliber guns. They exploded locomotives by the thousand, and burned freight cars in uncounted numbers. No train in daylight hours was safe. No marshalling yard a haven. The enemy's desperately needed rail transport system was shattered all over the map. taking gasoline when you hit it. No target too small, even a single railroad car. The Hun tried to hide his trains in the woods, but it did not save them. us lots of damage. They took plenty in return. Radio and radar stations came in for a special beating. Flank and machine gun defense was forced upon the enemy wherever he hoped to move. It was intense. Watch these bursts of light flank. Much of it our skillful pilots knew how to avoid. Some of it cost us grievous losses. None of it turned us aside. system as he was able to take it into the crucial test. Yes, this is the report our fighter pilots send back to you. 
the great armadas of our bombers sailing unhindered through the enemy air. Our gallant armies driving ahead without having to keep one eye cocked over their shoulders. Their gun emplacements unobserved. Everywhere above the mighty battle was and is the flash of American fighters. The thunderbolt, the lightning, the mustang. The Germans see them deep in their own sky and cringe. Our men see them above the grim fight and cheer. There are remembered names in the mess halls. Major Gerald Johnson, a crack shot. Major Goodson, gallant fighter. Major Dwayne Beeson, great tactician. Captain Eugene O'Neill, one of the best. Major Don Gentilly ran up a flaming record. Colonel Don Blakesley, great leader of 4th Group. Major Walker Mahuron, one of the first and best of the great aces. Major Bob Johnson and all his victories. Lieutenant Colonel Kabreski, with a great career. And Colonel Hubert Zemke, famous commander of 56. A score of victories or more on the records of them all. Duncan, Schilling, Pretty, and many, many others. But this is not the story of our heroes. It belongs to all our gallant fighter pilots who in the decisive hour smashed the Luftwaffe and gave us freedom of the air.